Your 60-40 portfolio doesn't work anymore? Says the Wall Street Journal. What? How double dog dare they? I've never heard this one before. Never heard this one before. Let's take a look. Uh, I've got this couple from a couple folks. And this is Spencer Jacob. He's been writing for a long time. What they spell Jacob, J-A-K-A-B. How dare you, Spencer Jacob? It's J-A-C-O-B, don't you know? We got a Bruins advertisement here because I was looking at Bruins tickets. I'd like to take my kid to a Bruins game. It'd be fun. For four decades, and this is the headline right here. You're set in forget it 401k made you rich. No more. Stock and bond portfolios work for that work for the past 40 years aren't ready for what's coming. Oh boy. Four decades, for four decades, patient savers able to grit their teeth through bubbles, crashes, political upheaval, won the money game. But the formula of building a nest egg by rebalancing a standard mix of stocks and bonds isn't going to work nearly as well as it has. I like how he says it won't. No, Fendi, uh-uh, we're not playing this game. How does he know? How does he know? I like how he says it isn't going to work nearly as well as it has. Now, long-term treasury yields have hit the highest levels in 16 years, causing their value to plummet. And stocks are expensive. Are they? Are they expensive? Huh? <laughs> so investor, I mean, what's the P ratio right now? The P.E. ratio at 23.5. I mean, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I mean, you, you can tell me that's, that's expensive. Well, before is historically lower. You know, we're not before now. I mean, look, here's 1970. Is that, what, 18? 1960? Is that 23? You know, 19, well, let's see. Right here is the beginning of the big bull market. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, is it expensive? Yeah, it's relatively expensive, but it's not up here anymore. I mean, come on. But the CAPE ratio, Josh, don't you know? Ugh. All right, so the stocks are expensive and treasury bonds have crashed, have plummeted. Uh, what does that tell you? Okay. Yields are the highest in 16 years on treasuries. Hmm, what does that tell us? The summer 2020 was the point when the classic set and forget it stock and bond portfolio was as good as it got. Uh, let's see. Uh, we, had, we cheered the quickest return to a bull market in history. Likewise, long-term treasury yields plunged to a record low, bolstering, bolstering bond funds. Well, the exact opposite happened last year, Spencer Jacob, J-A-K-A-B. Last year, the 10 to freaking interest rates went so far, the bonds got killed. And we had a bear market in stocks, so we've never seen anything like this. So we paid back for what happened in 2020 and 2022. We paid back for what happened in the aughts with the teens. So the aughts were horrible. The teens were great. It's, it just, it all evens out, man. I mean, I don't know if it will. I don't know. All right. A classic 60-40 stock bond split, owning that proportion of the S&P and the 10-year Treasury, earned a respectable 15% in 2020. Right, but there are few free lunches. Squeezing those impressive returns out of worldwide economic calamity add to the U.S. government's already considerable bill after the global financial crisis. Federal debt held by the public mushroomed from less than five trillion in mid 2007 to more than 21 trillion in 2020. All right, do I need to do this again? Oh, I think I do. The public debt right here. We had 33 trillion bucks. What was old Jacob saying? We had 21 in 20 in uh in 2020. We had 21 trillion in 2020. Look at all that debt. Don't you look at that? Holy crap. Oh my goodness, it's gonna bankrupt. Look how low it was down here. And then we go to edit graph, we go to format, we go to log this, we hit that, and we go, oh, that doesn't look nearly as breathtaking, does it? No, it looks pretty linear to me. A little jump right there in 2020, but not anything significant relative to the debt levels we've been accumulating since 1966. I mean, come on. This is the federal debt. So when you log it as a percentage of a change from the previous year, it look, doesn't look nearly as, uh, as scary, does it? No, we'll unlog it so you can show you again. You can see what it looks like. Look, oh my goodness, look at that jump. It shows you. Ah! And then we log it as a percentage as opposed to the actual dollar amount. Just look nearly as bad. All right, so he says from five trillion to twenty-one trillion in from two thousand seven to two thousand twenty-one. All right, so we'll unlock it. So we'll go five trillion in two thousand seven. Uh, right? No, no, it's not. It wasn't at five trillion. What's this guy talking about? In two thousand seven, we had eight trillion. Yeah, what the hell are you talking about, Jacob? I mean, this is the Fred. So what's he talking about? 
public debt mushroomed from less than five trillion in two thousand seven to more than twenty one trillion. What, dude? That's this is the two thousand seven, right? Eight trillion, nine trillion. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah, but it, man, let's keep going. All right. Anyway, meanwhile, overnight interest rates were pushed down to a once unthinkable zero percent, where they stayed with until twenty twenty two. All right. Suddenly, the best investments were in companies that were earning little to no money, but had a great story. You know? Goldman Sachs had rallied nearly 300 percent in nine months. Junk investments had posted gouty returns before. Uh, and it was usually a sign that money had become too cheap and never been free, though. All right. Ten year real return for U.S. stocks by starting quintile of Schiller's P.E. ratio. Again, if he's using the Schiller, it's probably the cape. All right. So we see the most expensive. 10 year, 2.65, the least expenses being 1982 is 10.83. So when are you going to start? Are you going to start in 2020, February 2020, March 2020? The PE ratios were down to eight. So, I mean, when are you going to start it? 10 year real return for starting. I mean, when right now we're at 20, I wish you had put the actual PE ratios. So when are you going to start? So if you started it in March of 2020, you'd be down here. I mean, are you going to, so when are you going to do it? What dates are you picking? By last year, the massive budget deficits and a 0% interest rate has stoked the highest inflation in 40 years. The massive budget deficits did that? Really? Because you're saying there weren't massive budget deficits over here? Hmm, let's take a look. Let's take a look, shall we? The budget deficits going back to 1981 or so, and these are all debt. Monthly, 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 monthly deficits, 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 and here's the, the debt itself. So while that looks, look how low that deficit is, Josh. Well, yeah, because the debt is quite low. So here we got a debt of 15, uh, actually, what is that right there? I got to go down here, right there. We got a debt of two point, I think it says three, five, we'll just say two and a half trillion dollars and a deficit of 220, I can't see what that is, 200, I don't know if that's millions or that's in millions. So is that $222 billion of a deficit, I guess? I, I you have to figure it out. You got to add some zeros there. But you can see as a debt goes up, the deficit goes up. The bigger deficits as a debt goes up. Isn't that interesting? Shocking. So, yes, it looks smaller here on a scale because the debt was smaller. As a debt goes up, the deficits go up. Now, let's compare that to the economy. You ready? We're going to add a line here and we'll just say U.S. GDP. Let's see if it says that. Gross domestic product. There we go. And we'll add a third line here. I'm not sure if this is going to work. Let's see what we got here. Hold on a second. Our GDP, which is in green, to our debt. All right. So remember, the deficits were slow over here. Our debt was low over here, and our GDP was higher. And look, so, uh, you see that right there? It's the same thing. The GDP is growing except at a rate higher than the uh, the deficit and the debt. Because remember, the deficit combined equals the debt. And it's just the whole thing is just silly. So massive debts versus, well, not relative to the massive GDP as a percentage of GDP is basically the same. Massive deficits as a percentage of GDP, is, it's just it's just not, nah, man. I mean, it can go on forever. I don't know. You don't know, no one knows. All right, so the last time inflation became so high stubbornly, it stayed there for years. The Fed, found, the Fed finally broke its back by pushing overnight rates above 19%. So 18 and a half didn't do it, but 19 did. 18 and a half, no, no, but 19 finally broke the bank, broke a Fed, the inflation is so freaking stupid. Interest rates long descent over the next four decades. Wait, 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 wait. So remember, massive budget deficits led to huge inflation. So we already showed you had massive budget deficits over the next four decades, and yet we did not have a huge inflation. In fact, we didn't have massive budget deficits in the 70s and 80s either relative to where we are today and we didn't have massive inflation so what caused inflation it wasn't massive budget deficits was it no it was something else what could have been oh energy costs shocking Ugh. anyway investor who put a thousand bucks in a 60 40 portfolio at the end of 1901 even after adjusting for inflation at basically 19,000 by the end of 20 uh, the end of 2020 all right the portfolio would have lost money in only five of those years all right no wonder why pros on Wall Street treat a classic balanced portfolio like a gospel. Here's Howard Marks from Oak Tree Capital Management. You'd have to have been working for more than 43 years, and that's be over 65 to have seen a prolonged period that was otherwise. An earlier generation had a completely different experience. In the mid-1960s, stock valuations were at the most expensive level in decades. 
We have the nifty 50 stocks. Yeah, I don't know if he talks about that, but and stocks are pricey just as inflation began to take off. The result, a family setting aside 1000 for the toddler's education at the end of 1965 ended up with only $785 at the end of 1982 when you adjust for inflation. Of course, we always laugh at how we adjust for inflation, but whatever. Things aren't looking much better today. Last year was one of the worst ever in real terms for the 60-40 portfolio, and the beatings could continue. Schiller's valuation metric is still higher now than it was in 1966. Yeah, but what were, I mean, I, you know, the bond market got destroyed from 1948 to 1969. So you could make an argument that the, uh, the bond market was, was going to take off, but it didn't because the rates were still quite low. The rates were lower in 19, probably 1965. I haven't looked, but right now the rates are higher than they've been in a long time. So just the interest rates are alone are much higher. So they're not going up to 1973, 74 to 1982 number. I mean, they could. I, I highly suspect that won't happen because we start so low. They've already had their huge run-up, which means the damage in the bond side is probably done. The P.E. ratios are just not that high. They're just not. I mean, they're, they're not low, but they're just not that high, man. Um, let's keep reading. When stocks have been the most expensive quintile valuations, they've had, only pr produced 2.7 on average. Yeah, but what have bonds done? What are bonds doing? Yeah, let's just say the interest rates don't change at all. We're getting five to five and a half on bonds. So if stocks only give you 2.7 because of high PE ratios, if they're in the highest quintile, which I don't believe because we just showed you, what are bonds doing? You're going to get five to five and a half percent of bonds. So let's say you got 40% in, in bonds, 60% stocks. So you, what you do is take 0.6 times point for simplicity 0 0.3. That gives you 1.8 on stocks. Uh, 0.4 times 0.5 for simplicity, that gives you 0.2 on bonds. That's 3.8% rate of return. No, that's not great, but it's certainly better than 2.7. Does that beat inflation? I don't know. Bond, a yin to stocks yang in a balanced portfolio, the real wild card. Even after the recent slump, investors are concerned that high, huge piles of federal debt combined with rapidly rising interest rates could produce financing strains for the U.S. Well, you think bonds are really anything affected by that? It's crazy. Anyway. Uh, how much might rates have to rise to keep attracting enough of the world's savings? Well, the biggest consumer of U.S. government debt is the U.S. government, by far. One unnerving possibility is that the Fed could reverse the course and push rates down again if today's high rates cause a recession or a stock market meltdown. Recession is going to be here in about six months. You know, like I, I thought I'd already be here. I thought it'd be Q3 of 2023. I'm absolutely wrong. There's no recession right now. Um, but certainly the way the markets are reacting, that, that's indic indicative of a recession six months out for sure. But we'll see. Who knows? No one knows. Uh, investors can prepare by lowering the return expectations. Yeah. Regularly rebalancing a mix of safer and riskier, riskier assets still trumps market timing. Wasn't well, that what regularly rebalancing does? With much less volatile short-term treasury bills yielding more than long-term bonds at the moment, investors can snag a decent return without being blindsided by further jump in rates. Do you actually expect a further jump in rates? I, I, this whole thing is just silly. Um, oh, my goodness. Small cap emerging markets and value stocks offer the benefit of diversification. That seem like much cheaper prices. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, okay. Anyway, that's just, that's, uh, can I put an, argument, an article uh, thing here right now? The Fed, I will say... If I could comment, where's comments? Ah, comment. No, they're not close. The Fed debt wasn't anywhere, was well above, was well above the five million or five. What does this guy say? But I'm not sure. I, I don't think I could put links in here. Well above the uh, five trillion. Is that what he said? Five trillion. Spencer said it was well above the five trillion. The author said in 2007, it was actually nine trillion. All right, All right there you go, man. Uh, who knows? I mean, look, at the end of the day, I mean, follow my, if you're near retirement, 25, 25, I mean, uh, 33, 33, 33, 30% 30 money market, 5.29 of the Vanguard federal money market account right now, 30% in intermediate long-term bonds. 33% in money market, 33% in uh, long-term and intermediate government bonds, and 33% in VTI. I mean, can you go wrong? Sure. I'm not a god, but man, man, that seems pretty good to me. All right, love your thoughts. We'll see you.